The algorithm. Yeah, okay, that's as generic as it is helpful. But really, this one pile of code knows you better than yourself? That doesn't seem right. And that's because it isn't. There isn't just one algorithm, there's multiple. YouTube uses what's called a two-tower neural network for its algorithm, starting with something called candidate generation. YouTube can't scan billions of videos every time you open the app. It would be too slow and computationally expensive. So it narrows the pool from around 100 million to 500. That first cut is handled by a system trained to understand your preferences with surgical precision. It represents you. This tower takes your watch history, search queries, liked videos, subscriptions, and even device type or location, when relevant, and turns it into a dense mathematical representation called an embedding vector. This vector is like a coordinate in a giant multi-dimensional space, hundreds of dimensions, where users with similar tastes are clustered together. The same goes for videos. The content tower generates embeddings for each video based on its metadata, title, tags, creator history, engagement stats, and even learned representations from the raw video file itself. The system then compares your user profile to each video's profile to see how well they match. The second tower. It does this using something called cosine similarity, a way to measure how similar two things are in a big mathematical space. This is part of a larger method called matrix factorization, which helps the system find patterns in what people watch. Imagine a giant spreadsheet where every row is a user, every column is a video, and each cell is how much you'd enjoy that video. Most of those cells are blank. Matrix factorization fills them in by identifying patterns. If you liked videos A, B, and C, and most people who liked those also liked D, then D might be a good suggestion for you. The result? A short list of a few hundred videos that are likely to match your interests. The result is then passed over to another neural network, focused on deciding which of these 500 videos are actually worth showing on your home page. It assigns a score to each video based on how likely you are to interact with it, taking all the information the two towers gave to it, things about you, how old you are, what you've watched before, and what language you speak, and things about the videos, the title, the picture, what it's about, and how long it is. This model goes painfully deep. Every action users take, clicks, views, likes, shares, comments, watch time, subscriptions, even skips, becomes a signal. Implicit feedback signals, if you want to use the technical term for it, weighted for how valuable YouTube thinks they are. For instance, a long watch duration usually means strong engagement. A like suggests satisfaction. Subscribing after watching a video? That's even stronger. But skipping a video or bouncing away after a few seconds? Negative signal. The system might even consider things like whether a video was shared externally or added to a playlist, tiny signals that contribute to the bigger picture. All of this is funneled into a loss function, a formula that the neural network tries to minimize during training. It predicts the expected value of each action and assigns a total score to each candidate. But YouTube doesn't just train one universal model. It often tailors models by region, language, or device type. And behind the scenes, engineers constantly A-B test changes to these weights. Want to promote longer sessions? Increase the importance of watch time. Want to boost creator growth? weigh subscriptions more heavily, want to reduce clickbait, penalize content that gets high clicks but low watch time. Every little change is tested in controlled experiments across millions of users before it rolls out globally, and is the cause behind creators complaining that the algorithm has changed again. But what about those brand new videos that don't have views or user data yet? This is where content-based filtering comes in. The system estimates engagement potential using the video's metadata – titles, tags, thumbnail, language, and upload time. It may also use transfer learning from the creator's past uploads to estimate how well this new video might perform. If the creator has a strong track record and your profile overlaps with their typical audience, the system might give their video a shot. In some cases, the recommendation system will even promote content early to gather engagement signals faster. Sort of a test balloon. To avoid Spotify's early problems of people complaining about the same songs being played over and over again, 
YouTube includes a diversity filter. If you've watched several videos from the same channel, it may hold back a few more from that creator in your feed to make room for other content. The goal is not just to serve you what you already like, but to keep you exploring. That's where exploration mechanisms come from, and it's possible thanks to something called Thompson sampling, a statistical method that helps the algorithm balance exploitation, recommending what it knows you like, with exploration, or trying new things. Think of it as an organized curiosity. It randomly samples uncertain videos, ones that might not score highest but that have potential, just to see how you react. If you engage, great! If not, that feedback helps recalibrate future recommendations. It's one of the reasons why your feed sometimes includes outliers. It's the algorithm probing your taste boundaries. This delicate balance is essential because too much exploitation creates filter bubbles, where your recommendations get narrower and narrower, too much exploration, and the feed becomes irrelevant. YouTube fine-tunes this balance constantly using Bayesian optimization techniques, where it models uncertainty explicitly and adjusts in real time. And speaking of real time, this whole system is designed to adapt fast. Every second you're watching, clicking, skipping, or sharing, it's feeding back into your profile in a schema called online learning. Unlike traditional machine learning, where models are retrained on a fixed data set, online learning allows models to adjust continuously based on new data. Some of this is done in memory, with temporary feature weights updated on the fly. Other parts are pushed into the full model during nightly retraining runs. The best way to visualize this is how your GPS sometimes tells you to go a different route to save a few minutes because of a traffic jam, learning not just from your behavior, but from everyone else on the road. That's how it stays in sync with trends, seasonal shifts, or even global events. Speaking of, thanks so much for all the support on the channel lately. It really means a lot, and I want to give something back to you guys. So do you need a job? That sounded a bit weird. <laughs> but whether you're a UX designer, app developer, freelancer, or just a curious viewer, I want to get to know you guys, share some UX and UI tips, and maybe even get a gig. So I made a Discord channel for us and want to make this the place to be for front-end professionals. And I'm having talks with people to get some employers in there so you can connect with them too and find some jobs in the future. I'm really excited to get this thing started, so I hope you'll join me. Freshness mechanisms can temporarily boost recent uploads or trusted sources to surface breaking news fast, even before engagement piles up. These dynamic freshness boosts ensure your homepage doesn't lag behind the real world. And in the background, a moderation layer also quietly filters out content that violates policies, preventing it from reaching the recommendation engine at all. This pre-filtering doesn't influence ranking. It simply limits the candidate pool to policy-compliant content. This entire pipeline, candidate generation, ranking, exploration, and learning, is distributed across a global network of data centers. It's powered by custom-built chips called TPUs, or tensor processing units, optimized for running these massive neural networks efficiently. When you open YouTube, your request hits edge servers that already cache pre-computed candidate lists. That's how recommendations load so fast. This blend of pre-caching, real-time modeling, freshness, and filtering ensures that even your very first scroll feels instantly relevant and safe. And even as you're watching this video, the system is watching you back. Every click, scroll, and second of watch time becomes part of a living, breathing feedback loop. Your engagement makes the algorithm just a bit smarter, not just for you, but for millions of others like you, across every screen and time zone. So yeah, you're not just watching YouTube, you're helping train it, shape it, and steer what comes next.